right. Well, welcome to Dome at Home, everybody. Hi, how are you doing? My name is Scott Young. I'm the Planetarium Astronomer with the Manitoba Museum, and this is Dome at Home, the museum's weekly astronomy show. We're going to be doing all sorts of fun things tonight. We're going to be taking a look at um, the life of a star, pretty much, uh, and not just one star, the life of many stars. Just like people, stars are born, they get older, and uh, the cycle repeats itself. And basically, we're going to be able to see all of those stages of a star's life in the um, in the evening sky. It's a perfect time to do that in the winter. Um, we're also going to be taking a look at uh, you know, some of the other space news that's been going on. And uh, then we'll be looking at some made in Manitoba rockets, the Black Brant rocket, which is sort of a hidden success story here in uh, the province of Manitoba. So. We uh, run this on Zoom, and for those of you in Zoom, please uh, drop into the chat where you're watching from, how many people are watching or so. Um, also, if you're with us on Facebook or YouTube, tell us where you're watching from. We love to be able to see what kind of reach we have, and and uh, it's just nice to see where everybody's uh, joining us from. With me, as always, is Mike, who will be moderating our chat and answering some of the questions that uh, I won't have time to get to as we go through the show. Mike, how are you doing? I'm pretty good, Scott. Yourself? Oh, uh, you know, not too bad. It's a little chilly and windy today. I was actually hoping we'd have uh, some clearer skies the last little while, but unfortunately, we haven't uh, haven't really had much. Yeah, definitely in the past day or so, it hasn't been great sky watching. Uh, listen, I know I shared with you a couple of days ago, but we got uh, some great email uh, from uh, to our space at manitobamuseum.ca. Uh, and it was from uh, folks down in Minnesota, actually, and I know that they're on right now. I, I can see their name on there. Uh, and they are watching along with family of theirs here in Manitoba. And I got to say, that is exactly what we hope for this program uh, and the Safe at Home grant that we got from the Manitoba government. Uh, we want everybody to be nice and safe. And it was so nice to receive that email uh, and know that people are watching and con connecting with their families, even in this time where we have to remain apart. Uh, and it was so good to, uh, to get that email. So thank you to them and thank you to all who are watching. Uh, it's been so great to receive feedback on this. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's great to see people, you know, doing this with their families. You've got intergenerational things. You've got friends that are getting together to watch the show. And, you know, if it ever if it ever clears up, we'll actually be able to go outside and, you know, share this kind of thing under the real sky as well. Um, Michael will be moderating our chat. And uh, we do get a lot of questions in every show. We can't get to all of them live during the show, unfortunately. So we try and answer the ones that relate to what we're talking about um, in the in this particular show. The ones that we can't get to, um, we'll try and get to between shows, or you can always drop us an email, as Mike said, space at manitobamuseum.ca. I'll uh, pop that up on the screen in a little bit, and Mike can drop it into the various chats. Okay, um, let's get right into things. I always like to begin with a, a little acknowledgement of one of my heroes that is sort of the, the impetus behind this show. Uh, Helen Sawyer Hogg, Canadian astronomer, wonderful person. She had a career that spanned half a century um, of some of the, the greatest scientific discoveries uh, of, the, uh, of the Canadian astronomy world, basically, as, as well as just seeing the changes in technology going from, you know, using photographic glass plates to using electronic cameras. It's, it's just amazing how, how much things have changed. Anyway, um, Dr. Hogg also wrote a column in the Toronto, I think it was the Toronto Sun, that uh, was basically a weekly column on astronomy, telling people what to what to look for and what to keep her eye, their eyes open for. And then she wrote a book, which is called "The Stars Belong to Everyone," and that really is the the impetus behind this show. I mean, the sky is something that we can all share, no matter where we are. Even if we're inside the city with a lot of lights and a lot of buildings around, there are still some things you can see. And even if not, we can still be together and and uh, share the stars virtually through the uh, through the system that we have here. Now. Let us move along to what's up in the sky. We're gonna start off, um, those of you that have been watching the show for a while know that the format has sort of been adapting as we go through here. Um, we kind of started off just pretty much winging it in terms of what we were gonna talk about. And now we're sort of starting to get a few regular segments. So Skywatch is our section where we just remind you what's up in the sky right now. And we did get some feedback 
about uh, making sure we cover all the directions because not everybody has a good view in all directions. I know my backyard, I can see straight up. And if I go into the front yard, I can see to the south, but everything else is blocked by trees or yard lights or, or whatever. So we're gonna try and cover all the directions here. And um, that will be the way that we can uh, make sure you can find a few things in the sky. So if you're looking towards the north, the north is that kind of area where the constellations move around, but they don't really change from season to season. We've got the things like the Big Dipper over here in the northeast. It's kind of standing up on its, on its handle here, three stars in the handle and then four that make up the Dipper. You can add some fainter stars in this part of the sky to, to turn that into Ursa Major, the Great Bear, although that's a little hard to see for some people, but the Dipper's pretty reasonable. Uh, in March, we're going to be talking about um, the relationship of the Big Dipper to the seasons. And there's a really cool story that we're going to try and bring you uh, that explains the, uh, explains the seasons as a consequence of the way the Big Dipper is oriented. So we'll talk about that. The two stars in the bowl of the Big Dipper here point to Polaris, the North Star. There's your direct view of the North. And from the North Star, you've got your little, um, little Dipper hanging straight down at this point. The other constellations, things like Draco, Cepheus, we talked about them in previous episodes. Cepheus the King was one of the characters in, in one of our um, Connect the Dots star stories, but there's not a whole lot else going on in that part of the sky right now. So we're gonna, we're gonna sort of move along. If you lean over towards the west, you know, the sun is setting still in the southwest, but due west about seven o'clock, right about now, we have the great square of Pegasus. But that's pretty easy to find, those four stars. All the other ones, a little fainter, but the great square is not too bad. And it kind of looks like a, a diamond, like a baseball diamond, actually. I've always sort of imagined that this is, this is home plate here, and you've got uh, first base, second base, third base. And uh, there's a faint star in the middle here that could be the pitcher's mound. And there's, uh, there's the bat catcher over here, and there's the manager coming out to yell at the umpire, you know, typical baseball kind of, kind of stuff. Um, that's what it looks like to me in the sky. You can use uh, your own version of that. Cygnus the Swan uh, is sort of fading away into the West. All these Western constellations are setting. And so each night they're gonna be a little lower and lower and lower in the sky until they disappear. The highlight of the, of the sky essentially is almost always in the South because that's, that's where constellations get to their highest point, their best visibility. And right now we've got Orion the Hunter. We talked about Orion in uh, episode four last week. Lots of uh, information there. We'll be going back to visit Orion again today. Uh, Taurus the Bull up above Orion. It's sort of right at the edge of uh, this map here. We'll, we'll focus in on it uh, a little bit more. And, and the red planet Mars is still up there, high in the south. In fact, just off the edge of this map, after I made the maps, I realized that after I scaled them, Mars was literally just off the, off the top of the, of the frame there. Over in the east, that's where new constellations rise. And so we have, um, oh, someone just, uh, Phil just asked, when can you see Gemini? Uh, right now, go outside. Well, if it's clear where you are, look towards the east and there are two bright stars sort of right up and, right, right up and down from each other. Those are the heads of the two stick figures of Gemini, the twins. So they're right over here. And um, Gemini is one of the zodiac constellations, which is, you know, related to your birthday and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, actually. And um, in the east, you can also see um, a very faint constellation, Cancer the Crab, which is pretty tough to see. But one of my favorite constellations is finally starting to peak up, Leo the Lion. Now, Leo, the only part we can see is, is really low, and it kind of looks like a sickle. So that, that's what this, uh, this little part of the group of stars is. It's called the sickle. This is actually supposed to be the, the, the mane of Leo and his nose sort of comes out here. To me, when Leo starts becoming visible, that means we are getting towards springtime. We're, we're, we're past the sort of the hump of winter, the really, really cold day is, the, uh, the days are getting longer, nights are getting shorter. And we're finally starting to get to some warm weather. So for me, Leo was really that, that harbinger of spring. For those of you that are looking straight up overhead, we still have uh, the constellation Cassiopeia, which is a great uh, W shape in the sky. We have Perseus the hero. That's what this uh, weird chain of stars is. It doesn't look like a hero at all, but you know, 
nonetheless. And then there's a, there's a fairly bright star. It was one of the brighter stars in the whole sky um, as part of Origa, the charioteer. These five stars are supposed to be a chariot driver on a chariot. Yeah, exactly. Kind of lo looks like the Pentagon, maybe. I don't know. But uh, we'll be talking about Auriga next week. We'll feature it because there's really some cool stuff to look around at in that particular constellation. Now, Auriga connects to Taurus the bull. And again, here, Taurus the bull is just off the bottom of my frame here. So I'm actually just going to switch right over to, to the live view here. And uh, I want to remind you all that uh, the, the maps that we just showed you are all available on the website. You can go to Manitoba Museum. Um, slash dome at home and uh oh, that, that's the email link but uh, yeah manitoba museum slash dome at home and you can download those as a pdf so you can take them all outside okay here's the sky sort of high up overhead in the south there's mars over there mars has been up for quite a while here's orion with his belt of three stars and sort of in between them is the constellation of taurus the bull Taurus is supposed to look like a bull with two big horns. And then uh, he's kind of half of a bull with a couple of legs. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I really don't see that picture. Again, the constellation is not always um, famous for what they, what they all look like. Let's see if we can just get, a, just get the one up here. Okay, so for me, the, the V-shaped group of stars here, this is called the Hyades, and it's a star cluster, and it's got one bright star in it, and that star is called Aldebaran. And uh, we'll be talking about Aldebaran a little bit later on, but this is a, a, a pretty distinctive group of stars because it is a bunch of bright stars that looks like the letter V. And then over here, we have, for most people, it looks like a little fuzzy spot. If you have a really good vision, you might see that it's a little cluster of stars and some people um, with really good vision, or if you use binoculars, will say that it looks kind of like a little dipper. I often have people say, I saw the little dipper last night and they'll describe it. That's right, uh, Phil says the seven sisters. Um, it's called the seven sisters because most people can see six stars. The story in many cultures, which is kind of interesting is that there were seven sisters in the sky there, but one of them came down to earth and married a man here on the earth. And so there's only six left. That, that story kind of sounds like an interesting, you know, um, legend or something like that, but it's so common around the world. Scientists actually think that there might've been one of the stars in the seven sisters that has faded in modern times. You know, maybe a, a few thousand years ago, there were seven that were easily bright and easily seen. And now there's only six. We really don't know. Almost nobody sees seven stars nowadays, though. You either see six, or if you have good vision, you see eight, because there's two that are exactly equally difficult to see. So most people will see six or eight. Actually, I see four, because my vision is not great. But the seven sisters, if you do have binoculars at home, point them at the seven sisters, because it really is a, a beautiful little star cluster. Um, and it, in fact, also point them at the the Hyades, the V-shaped group of Taurus, the, the bull's face, really, really nice to, uh, to look at as well. In fact, everything in the night sky looks great with binoculars. So Taurus the bull is a constellation that um, is what we call one, one of the constellations of the Zodiac. And the Zodiac, oops, is a group of constellations that go all the way around the sky and they are used for horoscopes and you do, can do astrology and that kind of stuff with them. I'm not really into that. I'm not going to get into that side of things. Um, I think it's cool that everybody seems to have a constellation that they, they sort of think of as theirs, though, because it gives you some ownership of, of the sky. So whatever your constellation is, or you can just pick one, those ones are special because of where they are in the sky, because those are the constellations that the moon the sun, the planets are all found within. So you see Mars over here. Mars is very close to this line here. This line is, is basically the path that the sun and the planets all take through the sky. And as things move around, for example, if we just sort of hit fast forward here and we let 
Mars move from night to night. It basically just cruises along through there. Uh, eventually the moon comes in and sort of ruins the view. So I'll just rewind. I can't turn the moon off without turning Mars off. So, but basically if you're looking through the Zodiac constellations and you see a bright star that sort of doesn't fit in, it's almost certainly one of the planets. So that's why those ones were all chosen for, um, for uh, the Zodiac constellations because the planets move through them. Um, so yeah, there are, um, there are a number of uh, connections with the things in the sky to the things in the ground. We had someone asking about uh, Seven Sisters Falls um, here in Manitoba. Is it named after the star cluster? I believe so. Um, the Japanese word for, um, for the Pleiades is Subaru. And so if anybody drives a Subaru, go look at the little logo on the front. It's basically a stylized version of the uh, star cluster there. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of things here on the ground are inspired by things that we have in the heavens. Okay, um, we are gonna look at, throughout the course of the um, series, we will look at a number of Zodiac constellations. We won't go through all of them. Um, and I, and uh, somebody asked what constellations are for what time of the year. It's not, um, how do I put this? Astrologers don't agree on that. There are certain dates that are connected to them. And then there are the actual dates where the sun would be in that constellation and the two don't match at all. They might've matched a few thousand years ago, but nowadays basically there's things have gotten out of sync. It's kind of like, imagine if we didn't do leap years and eventually the calendar would have just got out of sync because we didn't have that extra day and, and, and everything would be all messed up after thousands of years. The same kind of thing has happened. And so the constellations don't really show up um, in the in the sort of right places. One thing I can tell you though, on your birthday, you're very unlikely to be able to see your constellation, your zodiac constellation, because by definition, the sun is sort of in that general direction. And so if the sun is up, it's daytime, you can't see stars. So if you wanna see your constellation six months after your birthday, that's the time to look for it. And we have all those star maps and uh, finding aids and things like that on our website. You can check those out. Okay, within Taurus here, there's the Seven Sisters star cluster up close. You can actually see it's not just Seven Sisters. There's there's about a thousand stars in there, and there there's all this blue stuff all over the place. Um, the blue stuff is basically leftover material from those stars being formed. And that kind of brings us to our main topic for this evening. We're going to be talking about the life of stars. So. Let us move along. Let's get back to our evening sky here. And I'll just make sure the proper images are ready to go. So all of the stars that we see at night, they were all born somehow. They have all lived their lives for different amounts of time. Eventually they will all die. They will, um, go on to the next generation and a new generation of stars will be born kind of like people. Now, the thing is people live, you know, a hundred years or so, maybe less, maybe more stars live billions of years. And so we can't actually, you know, get a telescope and look at a star and then 10 years later, look at the star and see it age. It ages so slowly that we as humans have not been, sentient long enough. We haven't, we haven't been looking at the sky long enough to see very many changes in the life cycle of a star. Luckily, there's billions of them out there. So the way we learn about a star's life cycle is we look at all the stars around the sky and we sort of figure out what their ages are. And then we can sort of put that into a, a sequence. It'd be like going into a mall and taking a picture of everybody you could see and then trying to figure out if humans started off as babies and then got bigger, or if they started off as adults and then got smaller, it's a complicated job, but we've managed to, we think, put it all together. So how do stars, how are stars born? This is, um, it's, it tries to put every, all of stellar astronomy into one slide. So if you're confused by it, don't feel too bad. Um, in the center of the screen, is where stars are born. It's a place called a nebula. And we'll talk about a nebula in a minute, but basically it is a cloud 
of hydrogen. Hydrogen is what stars are made out of. And when you got a lot of hydrogen together, you can start making stars. And gravity will sort of take some of the hydrogen and squish it down and pull it together. And once it's a little bit bigger, it has more gravity. So it'll pull more things in. And long story short, you wind up with this cloud of hydrogen forming into stars. They make first proto stars. And um, so in our diagram here, there's two different paths they can take. So on the left, we're gonna talk about the life cycle of a star like our sun. On the right, we're gonna talk about a life cycle of a star that's much bigger. So the Orion Nebula, Let's see if I can get both of these viewing at the same time. There we go. Uh, there's Orion, the belt of three stars across the middle. Hanging down from his belt is a sword. And in the sword, if you use a binoculars or a telescope is this little fuzzy cloud which is the Orion Nebula. And so the, the image on the right is what it looks like um, through a, a, an electronic camera. A huge cloud of hydrogen gas that is right now making baby stars as we watch. So in the center of the uh, nebula, right down in there, there's a little cluster of stars called the trapezium. There are, um, it looks like four stars, but it's actually six stars that are packed very close together. And they have just formed out of this hydrogen gas. And as you can see, there's lots of leftover hydrogen. So there's gonna be more stars there. In fact, if we wait long enough, all of that hydrogen will get made into um, stars. And instead of the trapezium, you'll wind up with a cluster of maybe a thousand stars. In other words, you'll wind up with something that kind of looks like the Seven Sisters. The Seven Sisters is what the Orion Nebula will look like after, I don't know, a hundred million years or so. Yeah, long time. The stars in the trapezium are only 300,000 years old, just babies. They are infants, just still in the cradle, essentially. The stars in the Pleiades are about 100 million years old. So they're still, I would say, you know, in elementary school, very, very young stars. And there's still some leftover gas there that is floating around. These this cluster of stars doesn't stay as a cluster for long though, because all the, all the stars, they're sort of moving around and the, the gravity pulls on each other. And sometimes they'll, they'll slingshot away from each other or they'll just start drifting away. And after another couple hundred million years, you wind up with things like the Hyades. There's the Hyades star cluster, the V-shaped group. This is another star cluster that has drifted apart more. It's actually also closer to us. That's why it looks a little bit more spread out. It's just, you know, uh, closer to us than the, than the Pleiades. But still, this is, you know, maybe 200, 300 million years old after, after the stars were born. So you wind up with, you start with your nebula, you wind up with your protostars turning into sun-like stars in a cluster, and eventually the clusters just sort of disperse, and you wind up with individual stars like the sun. Actually, probably not like the sun. Half of the stars in the galaxy are multiple stars with maybe two suns going around, you know, like Tatooine with the two suns rising and stuff from Star Wars, uh, or three stars or five stars. Um, multiple star systems are by far more common. So the sun with a single star is a little bit less common, but still you wind up with a, a sun-like star and it burns for, oh, 10 billion, 12 billion years or so. And Eventually it runs out of fuel. Now we could do an entire show on the process that, that happens to make, to have a star make energy. We're not going to right now, but suffice it to say when the sun, a sun like star runs out of fuel, it actually starts burning other things and it starts to swell up and it turns into what we call a red giant star. And a red giant star is bigger and brighter than the sun. So the sun would actually expand out and get bigger and bigger in fact, it would expand out so far that it would absorb planets like Mercury and Venus and possibly even the Earth. So in about 12 billion years, over the course of that time, planets that might have been around that star are going to disappear. Luckily, that's a long time, so I'm not personally all that worried about it. I, we, we figure the sun's about halfway through its life, so the sun is you know, probably... 29 and holding in terms of uh, human birthdays kind of thing. The um, 
you know, another 5 billion years or so before the sun swells into a red giant. After the sun um, turns into a red giant, well, what's an example of a red giant? Let's look at the constellation of Taurus again. Here's the Hyades star cluster, that little V-shaped thing. And there's the one bright star, Aldebaran. That's a red giant. So that's what our sun is going to look like in 5 billion years or so. And then what happens? Well, after the, the star totally runs out of fuel, that red giant atmosphere just sort of starts to cool off, but it keeps expanding and it just sort of floats out into a big, kind of like a smoke ring um, that we call a planetary nebula. Sidebar, astronomers are terrible at naming things. Planetary nebulas have nothing to do with planets. They're called that because when people had the first telescopes that weren't very good, they were looking at these things and they kind of looked like the planet Uranus and the planet Neptune. And they thought, oh, I've discovered a planet. Oh no, it's a nebula. Well, let's just call it a planetary nebula. And so we're stuck with that name. This, this is basically the smoke ring from a dead star. And down in the very center, there is a tiny little core of the star remaining. That's a white dwarf star. That's all that's gonna be left of a star like the sun once it finally runs out of fuel. And eventually that nebula will just over you know, millions of years will just expand off and cool off and disappear and dissipate and the gas will float back out into the, into the galaxy where it will join the other hydrogen that's out there and can be used in the next generation of stars. So it's kind of a big recycling thing. You wind up with uh, most of the material from the, the star going back into the, the pot to make the next batch, which is uh, pretty cool. Okay. That's a star like the sun. And like I say, six billion years from now, five billion years from now, that's about when we have to start worrying. So the, the stars like the sun, they actually burn for a long time. Bigger stars actually burn way faster. If you've got a, star, a, a cloud of uh, gas, the nebula makes a really big star, a massive star. It makes what we call a, a giant star um, or a super giant star. If we wanna take a look at that in the sky, Let's go back to Orion here and just zoom out a bit. Orion, we've got our belt of three stars. There's a bright star down in his knee here. This is the star Rigel. Rigel is a blue supergiant star. It is only 8 million years old, not billion, million. It was formed and it is already burning um, so quickly that it's 8 million years uh, from its birth. It's already close to running out of fuel because it just burns so quickly to be so bright. When it runs out of fuel, it's also gonna swell up into a red giant. But if you're already starting as a giant and you get bigger, we call you a super giant. So a red super giant star, Rigel in maybe another million years or so will run out of fuel and start turning into something more like Betelgeuse, the star on the other side of Orion. Betelgeuse is a red super giant star. We talked about it uh, last week it's almost out of fuel. And when a big star runs out of fuel, it does not go quietly into the night. It doesn't have a little smoke ring or anything like that. It explodes. It blows up in a giant explosion called a supernova. Betelgeuse could go supernova any day now, any time in the next you know, few thousand years really, but it might be tonight, might be tomorrow. So keep your eye on it. When a star goes supernova, most of the stuff is just blown to smithereens and you wind up with just a little cloud of wreckage that's left. Um, that looks kind of like a nebula, but it's not nice and round and symmetric. Like here you can tell that this is like blown all over the place. It's, it's like wreckage from a dead star. This is also in the constellation of Taurus the bull, actually. I'll, I'll get our constellations back here. Where we go. There's Taurus with the V shape of the Hyades here. Aldebaran, the red giant star, over near its horn, right over here. You can't see it unless you have a telescope because it is quite faint. It's, it's quite far away as well. It's called the Crab Nebula. And the Crab Nebula is what's left over after a star has exploded. Deep down in the center here, we'll sort of zoom in here. Deep down in the center, there actually is a little bit of um, activity still going on. There's a, there's a little star in the, in the very center here. That's the one that's exploded. We zoom in even more. Let's see, we'll sort of zoom in like that. That star that's flashing on and off, 
that is the, rem the remnant of the supernova explosion. Well, why is it flashing? Like what's going on? Well, what's left behind after a supernova explosion, the outer parts of the star blown out like crazy. The very center of the star though gets blown in and compressed and it becomes what's called a neutron star. Neutron stars are really, really weird. They're basically one gigantic atomic nucleus and they shoot these sort of, it looks like lasers shooting out the, the sides and as they spin around, that, that beam happens to be pointed at. It's kind of like a lighthouse and it gets brighter and then it gets fainter. And then it gets brighter and then it gets fainter. The neutron star in, um, in the Crab Nebula spins 30 times a second. So if you can imagine something spinning that fast with that much energy. So even after the stars run out of fuel and blow itself to pieces, you've still got this amazing level of activity. If the star was big enough, even this is not the end of the road though. If the star still has enough material that its weight has enough gravity, it just keeps pressing itself down and, and pushes past the neutron star stage and turns into one of the strangest potential objects that exist, the black hole. A black hole um, is black. It is completely invisible. There is no possible way to see it. But you can see the stuff that is orbiting around it and spiraling in. Because if you get too close to a black hole, you're not getting out. The gravity is so strong that you would just not be able to escape. And so it gets this material all spinning around it and, and it's going very, very fast. And so it starts to heat up and, and uh, we can see all this, this radiation and things like that. There are no black holes nearby. You don't have to worry about it. That's right, Lucy, even light is pulled in. That's why they're black. Any light that came off of the, the black hole would get sucked right back in. And we can only see things if they give off light. So it's kind of the ultimate stealth kind of material. The problem is if you get too close to it, it would rip you apart atom by atom by its, its tremendous gravitational force. That's what happens with absolutely big um, stars, the ones that are the most massive. Now, luckily, that's not a big proportion of them. So it's not like we have black holes all over the place. We think they're fairly rare. There are none close to the Earth. But um, still interesting to see, you know, basically you start off with just this cloud of hydrogen and you can get all these different variations of things that are up there in the sky. That is basically an entire full year university course given in what, six minutes. So it's definitely, uh, we're simplifying things quite a bit here, but it gives you a sense of, of how it works. Stars um, live a long time. And there's all different kinds of them. Many of them are bigger than our sun. Many of them are smaller than our sun. Um, so we're kind of in the middle there. Now I'm seeing a whole bunch of questions go by here. Mike, why don't we, uh, why don't we throw this open to questions for a few things? I see a couple that are going by. Uh, do you got any that, uh, that you've got queued up there? Well, um, oh, some, uh, we have a, a viewer on Facebook that just wants to point out that you have said Beetlejuice three times. Um, <laughs> Which, yeah, I think uh, you have to say it. I think it's okay if you say other words in between. Okay, say okay. Just Beetlejuice, well, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Okay. Um, actually, a couple of good questions I'd like you to touch upon. We've got uh, Patrick on, on Facebook, nine-year-old Patrick on Facebook watching, and uh, Abby on <laughs> Zoom. And they sort of want to ask Hi, somewhat of a similar question in a way. They may not realize it. Uh, so Patrick's question is, in 1,000 years, what would the Orion constellation look like? And Abby's question, which is going to be related to it, is what happens to a constellation after a star explodes? Wow, yeah, those are related, and they're both great questions. All of the stars out there, they're moving, but they're so far away from us that we can't notice the motion even in hundreds of years. There are only a few stars that are close enough to us, we can actually see their motions and they move so small, you have to look in a telescope to be able to, to even notice it. So unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, um, the constellations don't change over thousands of years. Um, none, of the, none of the patterns will really change. Over you know, 100,000 years, you'll get changes. But even then, 
only a few of the stars will have moved. The stars are just so amazingly far away that it takes forever for those kinds of changes to happen. So you don't have to worry about learning new constellations next year or anything like that. They're, they're gonna be nice and standard. If a star explodes though, like if we look at Orion again, and we've got uh, you know the nice belt of three stars and we've got his shoulders up here and here's Betelgeuse and Betelgeuse decides to go supernova. Well, after it fades away, what's it gonna look like? Or, or are we gonna, you know, I guess there's another star here. We could just pretend that the, the line goes over to that star instead. Eventually, if you get enough stars going supernova or burning out or things like that, I guess you'd have to come up with new constellations for that reason as well. But again, it takes so much longer for stars to really change that it's not something that we've ever had to really, really worry about. So even if you go to other planets, the constellations still look the same as they do from here on Earth. Great questions. Yeah, they are what else great you got? questions. Uh, we'll do another one here. A lot of people asking about how many stars can a nebula make? Uh, and some people are specifically looking at the Orion Nebula, uh, but some are more general in terms of just any nebula. Can, how many stars could they make? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't really know because we only know, um, you know, we see some nebula that have some stars in them, you know, a few hundred or whatever, but they, there's still nebula left. And then we see some star clusters where most of the nebula has been, has been used up, but maybe some of the stars have already, you know, disappeared and, and fade or, you know, spread out from the star cluster. Uh, the Pleiades has about a thousand stars. It's, that's probably a reasonable number. I'd, I'd say you could probably come up with you know, a, a good sized nebula making a thousand stars, but there's also probably small nebulas all the way out there, all over the place that we, we don't even see them that could be making stars in, you know, onesies and twosies where you wind up with just one star system or things like that. Um, you, you know, the, the gas is spread out all over the place. And, and because you have these supernova explosions going off, the, the shock wave from those explosions ripples out and it can push the gas together all over the place and it can start stars forming. So I would say, you know, up from one or two up to about a thousand or so, maybe more than that, but we haven't seen it. Great, yeah. And our final question before we uh, will move on is Adriana, eight-year-old Adriana wants to know, what is your favorite star? My favorite star? Um, I kind of like Chris Hem Helmsworth. No, um, that's not the kind of star you were asking about. Um, you know, I like Betelgeuse just because it might blow up any day. Um, and I like the stars in Orion's belt because that's, uh, that's something that I've seen, you know, every winter since I was a kid and it just seems very familiar to me. So uh, their names are uh, Alnilam, Alnitak, and Mintaka. Those are kind of crazy names, but there you go. Great question. Um, I did have up here, the first ever picture of a black hole. Um, everybody was excited about this. And then the picture came out and they said, that's a horrible picture. Um, and it absolutely is a horrible picture, but keep in mind, we're trying to take a picture of something that you can't see. So this is, this is actually pretty good from a science point of view. Obviously the black hole is the center part and the um, gas floating around it is the, uh, the glowing stuff that we see. Okay, um, it's time for us to move on a little bit. We will get to some more questions again later. I don't know if you've noticed, but our show has been getting longer and longer uh, every week because we're getting more and more questions. And uh, so, yeah, we're definitely going to get a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions in towards the end here. We're going to uh, move to our section uh, that I like to call Cool Space Stuff. Cool Space Stuff! All right, so um, 50 years ago this week, the Apollo 14 mission was on the way to the moon. Uh, in fact, sorry, they had landed on the moon already. And people were walking around on the moon and picking up rocks and stuff like that. One of the most amazing engineering uh, challenges that humanity has done uh, ever. We don't do it all the time because it was really expensive and really difficult and dangerous. Apollo 14 followed the 
previous mission, Apollo 13, and you probably heard about that one, the Houston, we have a problem um, mission. Actually, it was more like Houston, we have 97 problems and they're all happening at once. So it was pretty crazy. Apollo 14 almost failed as well when they were trying to get the, uh, the two spaceships together to, to get them ready to go off to the moon nothing was working. And then they managed to get the whole thing working and uh, it, sort of at the last minute and were able to continue with their mission. These guys didn't get the, uh, the cool lunar uh, dune buggy that the later missions got. They basically got a wheelbarrow to pull stuff around on, uh, on the moon. So not nearly uh, as cool, but a really great mission. And they landed in, in the spot that Apollo 13 was supposed to land. Um, the highlands of the moon. So there's a, a different kind of area from the, from the first missions looking at, uh, you know, different kinds of rocks and trying to find out the origins of the moon and things like that. Probably most famous thing that happened on Apollo 14, uh, the commander Alan Shepard brought along a golf club and attached it to his, uh, his geology sampling uh, claw thing and uh, hit a couple of uh, sand trap shots on the moon. So the first golf shots on the moon uh, were 50 years ago today. So if, uh, if that doesn't make you feel old, um, then you're probably not 50 years old. Uh, 1971 was 50 years ago. That's crazy. Okay. Also 50 years ago, the Apollo mission was going on. Other countries were trying to do stuff in space. The Russians were in the space race. Canada was launching more rockets than any other country. And that's because we have the best small rocket program in the world. Okay, I'm biased. And yet we, uh, Lesia is saying uh, Churchill rocket range. That's right. The Black Brant rocket is a small rocket. And by, by small, I mean, it's the one that we've got is, uh, I guess about nine meters long or so. It's about uh, this big around. And it's not the kind of thing you put people in. It's the kind of thing you put experiments in. And it doesn't go into space and go into orbit. It just goes up and down. So it can't stay up there for very long. But what it lets you do is go up quite high up and study things like the Northern Lights. So it turns out that one of the best places in the world to see the Northern Lights from is Churchill. Manitoba. So they built a rocket range up there. If you've ever been up there, you've probably seen it. The Black Brants were launching every few weeks 50 years ago from Churchill, and they were going up, you know, um, 800, 1,000 kilometers into the air, having a, an instrument out there to measure the, the uh, electrical charges and, and take images and, and uh, spectrum and all sorts of scientific measurements of the Northern Lights to try and understand them. And then they would parachute back down to the ground. So these are like one use rockets. They're built here in Winnipeg. Uh, Magellan Aerospace um, bought out uh, the original company, Bristol Aerospace. They're still making them today. In fact, one of them uh, was launched by NASA just a few months ago to test out the parachute of the Martian uh, rover that is landing two weeks from now. So you probably know there's spacecraft on the way to Mars. The Perseverance rover lands on February the 18th. And as it comes hurtling in, the first thing that it slows down by, uh, by slowing down in the atmosphere, and then it pops out this parachute at really high speed. To test that, they basically used a Black Brant rocket, fired it up, and then sort of turned it around and fired it back down to make sure that it would not tear when it deploys. Because if your parachute doesn't open, your mission is pretty much done. So a little Canadian contribution there to the, uh, the Mars uh, mission that's going on. I found that out just this afternoon at a uh, NASA educators conference that I'm attending virtually, unfortunately, not, uh, not down in Houston. Up in Churchill, it's a great place to launch rockets. It's right on Hudson's Bay, so you can sort of fire them out in that direction and be pretty sure that it's not going to, the pieces aren't going to come down and land on anybody's house or anything like that. Um, there are a few places out there where the rockets have sort of gone down into the tundra and you can just see them sticking up with the fins out, kind of like lawn darts. Um, but it's a, it's a very uh, easy place to maintain the, um, the line of sight and all that kind of stuff. It's cold, though. 
And so they had to be tested for cold weather and so on. But the Churchill rocket range is no longer active. We're not launching rockets there anymore. It, it, its last launch was in the early 90s. Uh, but before that, it had been mothballed for a while. It's in pretty rough shape. I was up there just a few years ago. And um, the Churchill uh, Northern Studies Center has taken over some of the buildings. But the other ones are just sort of there falling apart, which is a little sad. It's kind of a nice piece of Canadian technological history. But um, anyway, the Black Brant built right here in Winnipeg. Now, if you go to the website, uh, uh, manitobamuseum.ca slash dome at home, you can download a model kit of a Black Brant rocket. This is actually a flying model. It was designed to fly uh, for an activity we did in the museum. And it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. You cut out a piece of, uh, of paper and roll it into a tube. I like to roll it around a pencil to sort of give it a bit of a curve. And then you glue it together, you glue the fins on and so on. You wind up with uh, you know, a rocket like this. This is a scale version of, uh, of one of the rockets. It is empty uh, and hollow. And the reason for that is that we had one of these uh, pretty interesting, um, we had one of these, um, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, like a like an air pump that you would pump up a uh, a uh, air mattress with, and we put that it into a tube and put it in the end here. And if you stomped on the air pump, it would launch the rocket. So that was a fun thing to do. You can try that with this at home. Also on the website, there are links to some other paper rockets. If you're if you're less interested in the flying model and more interested in sort of having a scale model, there are, it's there are some amazing um, and free paper kits to. Uh, cut out and, and print out yourself and make scale models of some of the rockets. So that's a kind of a fun thing to do. Mike's dropped that into the chat. So you can uh, can visit our, our site there. And um, there's always something downloadable from all of our, all of our different, um, all of our different activities or things like that. All right. Let's see. Just want to make sure that I didn't miss anything before we go on to uh, getting a few more questions here. We, um, right, we do have uh, some great stuff coming up over the next two weeks. There are three robot spacecraft on the way to Mars right now. Two of them get here, two of them get there next week, the same day as our show. And one of them gets there two weeks from now, the same day as our show. So basically we're gonna have a show on the same night uh, as all of these spacecraft getting to Mars. I really hope that they work so that we have some cool stuff to talk about. Although if they don't work, there'll be something to talk about as well, I guess. But I'm really excited to see what discoveries might get made on Mars. So that's gonna be on next week and the week after. We're also still gonna do the regular things, you know, the constellations, what you can see in the sky and stuff like that. But that'll be our feature for the next couple of weeks. If there's something you'd like to see, drop us a line. You can either um, join us with a, um, here we go. You can join us on Facebook or YouTube, leave us a comment, drop something in the chat here if you're on Zoom, or you can drop us an email, uh, space at manitobamuseum.ca. Tell us what you'd like to see. Tell us, uh, you know, share with us some of your uh, observations. Tell us, um, I'd love to see if somebody builds a Black Brant rocket model. Show me that. Uh, we'll have some pictures next week of, uh, of some solar system models that came in. And uh, so, yeah, we like, uh, we like sharing uh, the, the things that come back. It's nice to know that people are doing some of these activities. Um, if you made a cool log book, we talked about having a log book and writing your observations down. If you made some neat drawings or just decorate it nicely, send us a picture. We'd love to see it. Trying to get uh, as many people out and doing things uh, under the sky as possible. Because remember, the stars belong to everyone. And so getting to know your stars and getting out there and, and observing them, it's a great activity something you can do with the people that you are, um, you know, isolated at home with, uh, staying safe at home. It's an outdoor activity. So once we can have groups together, you can, you know, be in the same park with someone, even if you can't be, you know, within six feet or whatever. It's the kind of activity that we'll be able to do quite a bit over the next little while as things slowly get back to normal. Um, and as the weather starts to warm up. So that's what we're going to be looking forward to over the next little while. 
All right, uh, Mike, you got, uh, we got time for a couple more questions here. I, things are flying past here in the chat, so it's just really hard to- Yeah, uh, I, the, the questions have been flying fast and furious here. So uh, I've been trying to keep up and uh, apologies to those that uh, I haven't been able to get to. Uh, over the next couple of days, Scott and I will try to go on the- uh, uh, go on and answer a few questions, especially in Facebook. But uh, one of the common ones, Scott, is, is people are really fascinated by black holes, as, as you and I both uh, are well aware. Uh, and some people are wondering what happens to things that go into a black hole, uh, especially what if a human or life were to go into a black hole? What what happens to them? Well, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a complicated question. It's actually... Hard to say, because before you can get into a black hole, you have to come close to a black hole. And almost anything, any material that we can think of would be torn apart before you even got to the black hole. Because what happens is, as you get closer, the gravity gets stronger. And the gravity is so strong that, for example, if you were, if you were say, in a spaceship flying towards a black hole, the gravity on the front of the spaceship would be so much stronger than the gravity on the back of the spaceship, it would actually rip the front off the back just from the gravity forces alone. It's called tidal forces. So it would be really, really hard to get anywhere close to a black hole. Um, if you could, if there was some way to do it, we don't know what would happen. All we know is that no one outside would ever hear from you again. It's possible that you would go inside and be ripped to pieces. It's possible you would go inside this black hole and it would be like some kind of like super secret club where there's like nice music and people bringing you food and stuff. I don't, we, we really don't know. The, the idea of, of what's inside a black hole is almost by definition outside of our universe. We can never know what is inside a black hole. I know that's hard to, hard to um, accept for m most of us, the idea that there are certain things that we just cannot know, but there is, there is some theory that's, that basically tells us no information can ever leave a black hole and come back out into our part of the universe where we could observe it. So no matter what it feels like, it would be a one-way trip. Yeah, exactly. Um, just to wrap things up, uh, we've got a lot of people commenting on, you know, how great it is to hear about, a, you know, a made Manitoba space uh, story uh, such as the Black Brant rocket and the Churchill rocket range. Uh, so a lot of people very pleased uh, to hear about that. Um, and uh, I just want to say I'm going to put a link in uh, both Facebook and uh, Zoom for a survey. Uh, and for those of you who have done uh, Dome at Home every week now since we started, uh, I know those seem kind of repetitive, but I promise you we are reading each and every survey. We're taking all our notes on what you'd like to see in upcoming episodes. And more importantly, we're taking notes on what you liked and didn't like about each episode. So even if those surveys sound repetitive, please continue to fill them out. They're amazing to read uh, and very important to us as we try to keep improving this show. So thank you yeah. all for doing that. And, uh, uh, and I'll put the link in there in just a few seconds. Yeah, and the, the surveys are extremely helpful. Um, we're, we're kind of breaking the internet with this show. Most internet shows or, you know, they, they count the number of people that watch you for three seconds or more. Well, we've got people watching for, you know, 57 minutes at a time. Nobody does that apparently for, for a lot of live programming. So we're kind of, and I'm not struggling, but we're trying to keep track of the, of the number of people that are watching and things like that so that we can show the value of programming like this. And, uh, you know, one day we'll be able to open up the planetarium and, and get you back under our dome. That doesn't mean this kind of programming necessarily has to stop. So let us know what you'd like to see. Let us know how, uh, how you'd like to learn about the sky and things like that. We are thinking about, uh, once we can, doing some outdoor telescope kinds of things. We'll be doing some of that as part of Dome at Home, and we'll be doing some other events that uh, once the weather warms up, and we hope the uh, the restrictions are relaxed a little bit, we'll be able to do some uh, telescope things as well and get people looking at the sky that way. Wow, what a great show. Thank you all so much for uh, visiting us. And I love seeing all the comments going by. Again, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything. There's there's just uh, hundreds and hundreds of them pouring in here. I know that uh, 
people can only see the comments that they type, I think. So essentially what's happening is it's just do, 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 do. There, there, there are dozens and dozens of these things just flying by. So uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to them. If there's a question you really want answered, drop us an email and we will get to it and we can uh, answer it by email for you. Thanks again to uh, the province of Manitoba, the Safe at Home grant for funding this program. And uh, it's been great to see you all. Join us again next Thursday at 7 p.m. where we start getting into what is up uh, with the planet Mars. Here, I'll turn on some uh, other links here so that you can see where you can join us. You can watch us live on Facebook or YouTube, and you can give us an email at space at manitobamuseum.ca. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. If it clears up, get out there and look at the sky. See you again soon.